Next to God, the most important relationships you'll ever have are with your family. We don't get to pick our family, but it's such an important relationship. It can be a struggle at times, but it's something that's always worth it to try to have that right relationship with as much as possible on our end. So tonight, as we continue our relationship series, as we continue a short look at four four of the most important relationships in our lives, we're going to look at family. This is called Family Matters. And we're in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, because this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. Fathers, don't stir up anger in your children, but bring them up in instruction, in, in the training and instruction of the Lord. So let's talk about family. Like it or not, there are people that we're stuck with. We don't get a choice in the matter. And it's a significant part of our lives. It's a big influence. It's a big time part of our lives. So let's talk about three things up front about family and then kind of how it relates to us and what we can do about it. Three things to remember about family. First is this, family is a God idea. It was his idea. In Genesis 1, 27 and 28, family was instituted by God. It's his design. It's his vision. It's his plan for humanity. Man and woman complete each other. Children are a blessing from God. And we see this in the first few chapters of the first book of the Bible in Genesis. It's the closest of human relationships. It's a need that God saw and he met. He said, it's not good for man to be alone. Home is where kids learn their value. Home is where kids learn their identity, their worth. They relate to to authority. It's where they learn all of these types of things. It's where children develop their values. It is a God idea, both for husband and wife and for children. So family is a God idea. Second thing, families exist because life is better together. God realized that we were not meant to live life alone, that that we didn't need to live life alone, that we need each other. And so he decided that it wasn't good for man to be alone. So first he gave the man a woman, and then he gave the man a woman children. God decided it wasn't good for us to be alone. So life is better. Life is much more fun when it's shared with other people. And families are a big part of that. Families are a big part of making life better. So it's a God idea. It exists because life is better together. And then thirdly, while family matters, Jesus must always be the first priority. Family is hugely important. It is the most important human relationships we'll ever have. But it cannot become the most important thing in our lives. Even something as good as family can become an idol. It can replace the place that God is meant to have in our lives. It can become more important than that, where we do things related to the family more than we do things that God wants us to do. Family matters a whole lot, but Jesus matters even more. And what he wants for us has to take precedence over what family wants for us. He has to be the utmost priority. He has to be the top thing in our lives. So what do biblically based families look like? What do they consist of? I'm going to give you a couple of things from this passage that we read from Ephesians chapter 6. And the first is this. In a godly, biblically based family, parents value and care for their children. Godly families occur when everyone seeks to fulfill God's expectations and God's roles. And parents are meant to nurture their children in life and in faith, to bring them up spiritually, to bring them up physically, to bring them up relationally, to train them in the Lord, to equip them to be who God created them to be, to equip them in the faith as well as in other ways. It says in, in various places in the Bible, including here, Parents are not to stir up their kids. They're not to provoke them to anger. They're not to destroy their confidence. They're not to wound their spirit. They're not to take away their love for God and family. They're not to provoke and arouse hostility. They're not to drive them to resentment. They are meant to value and care for their children. And if parents neglect that call to value and instruct in godliness, the devil will swoop in and counter and and teach them wicked things and teach them how to live in a wicked way and and lead them and instruct them towards wickedness instead of towards godliness. So parents value and care for their children spiritually and otherwise. Second side of this, the other side of this, is that children respect, honor, and obey their parents. Children were made by God to glorify God. Obedience shows respect. Obedience shows love. Obedience shows honor for God as well as for parents and for other authority. This happens not just through our actions, but also through our attitudes. Obedience also includes our attitudes. If we're obeying, if we're doing what we're supposed to do action-wise, but our attitude stinks, we're not really obeying. In a very real sense, the Bible says that our lives can be longer when we obey our parents. And this can be a literal thing. You disobey your parents, get drunk behind a wheel, you can die. But the quality of our life, as well as the quantity of our life, can be extended through honor, respect, obedience to the parents. 
If we're being asked to do ungodly things, that's a whole different thing. If there's, if a parent's asking you to go buy drugs, if a parent's asking you to go buy alcohol for them or to go, you know, do things that go against God's plan, go against the law of the land, we're not to obey. But that's the only case. Otherwise, we show love for God. We show respect and honor for parents as we obey. So biblically, in biblically-based families, parents value and care for their children. Children respect, honor, and obey their parents. So how can we kind of wind this down? I, I, I titled this part for when we're in person, I can do my part. We all have a role. We all have a part in godliness and families and biblically based families. And the first thing that we do is we honor God when we honor our family. A parent is the most godlike creature on earth. Like a parent, or like, like, a, like God, a parent has created. The fifth commandment tells us to honor our parents. The word honor means more than just be nice to your folks. Dishonor for parents is dishonor for God. We treat them with courtesy. We treat them with thoughtful consideration. We seek to understand them and we seek to ultimately to obey them as long as they're not leading us in ungodly paths. They deserve that. If for nothing else, than for giving us life itself. Honoring our parents is literally an act of worship to God. They deserve it. God commands it. We don't honor them because of what they've done. We don't honor them because they're always right, because they're not. Surprise, surprise, right? It's not conditional. We obey, we honor. Second thing, we realize that nobody's perfect, and that includes us. Sometimes what I hear as a youth pastor and what goes on in all of our lives is that we're expecting the other person to be perfect while we're not expecting ourselves to be. The sooner we realize that nobody's perfect and that that nobody includes me, the sooner we can move forward with life, the sooner we can move forward with love, the sooner we can move forward with forgiveness in family and in other parts of our lives. We tend to see the flaws in other people but ignore the ones in ourselves. We tend to not recognize the ones in our, in our own lives. But when we recognize the flaws in our own lives, we give the benefit of the doubt to the other person. We start seeing them as perfectly imperfect. We start seeing them as not really that much different than us. We give the benefit of the doubt. We're quicker to forgive. We're quicker to love. We're slower to judge and we're slower to begrudge them. So we realize nobody's perfect, including me. And then finally, we live with no regrets. It's so easy, especially in family, the person, the people you're around more than anybody else, it's so easy to do things, say things that down the line you're going to regret, to say it and know that you shouldn't have said it, to have to come back later and apologize, have to come back and ask forgiveness. But here's the thing. We need to treat every moment with people, especially with our family, as if it could literally be the last, as if it could be the last moment we get with them, as if it could be the last time we ever get to see them and ever get to be around them. We need to make sure that they know we love them. We need to make sure that we watch what we say. We need to make sure that we don't let things remain tense, that we don't let things remain unresolved, that we don't let things remain unforgiven. We need to watch what we say. We need to watch what we do. We need to watch our words, our actions, watch our attitudes. Ask forgiveness, show forgiveness, give forgiveness. Show love and respect while you can. Live with no regrets because you don't know when it's going to be the last time you get with your family. My parents are getting older. We're starting to see family members pass away. I have an aunt that just died over the weekend. We never know when it's going to be our last time. So we need to ask ourselves this. Am I doing my part to build healthy and godly relationships? All these things we talked about tonight revolve around that. Am I doing my part to build healthy relationships? Am I doing my part to build godly relationships? A man named Dr. Chuck Quarles shared at a conference, and everybody was blown away, and everybody was impressed with him. And this one man was super impressed with him. And he goes up to him and says, how did you become so prolific? And his answer was this, I sacrificed my son. The man was confused. So Dr. Quarles said, I sacrificed my son. And then he went on to tell them what had been his greatest regret, that he had been so driven to write, that he had been so driven to publish, that he had been so driven to research, so driven to teach, so driven to teach or to make a name for himself that he had neglected his family. And his son grew up a stranger to his father, and his son became homeless and was currently living on the streets. And he said, I would give up all of this to have my son back. Are we doing our part to live with no regrets? This man had a lot of regrets. Here's the thing. I know if you're in my youth group, I know if you're listening to this or watching this on Facebook or Instagram, some of you have awesome families. And just to put it bluntly, some of you have far from that. There's a place for all of us at God's table. Tonight, evaluate your relationship with your parents. Evaluate your relationship with your siblings. Realize you can't be right with God if you're not right with those other people in your life, especially family, as best as you can 
on your part. You're not the only one responsible, and you're not completely responsible, but you are responsible for your side. You are responsible for your part in that. The Greek word for honor means to revere, to prize, and to value. Are we doing that with our families? Honoring our family must happen or we're not right with God and we're in for a lot of heartache and pain in our lives. Healthy families produce healthy people. He created you, but he also created them. He created your family too. This is not always fun. This is not always easy. It's a daily struggle and it's a struggle that needs Jesus in it. With prayer, with submission to God, with genuine desire to do his will, honoring our parents can become a little bit easier. It can become life change. It can become literally an act of worship and honor unto the Lord. Tonight, no matter what your family situation is like, consider your role, consider your part in helping shape and make your family that situation, a healthier, more whole, more godly situation. Family shapes us in a lot of ways in our lives. Tonight, lay your family situation, whatever it may be, at the foot of Jesus and know that you're not alone as you seek to live in godliness, as you seek to live for him in this critical area of life.